Well, hey, Northside family, how are we doing? Good. I'm, uh, I'm glad to be with you today. And if I haven't had the privilege of meeting you yet, my name is Aaron and I'm a part of the teaching team here. And I consider it just a great privilege to have the opportunity to share God's word with you today. And I want to say at the outset of my message today that this is not a New Year's Eve message. This is a Christmas message. In fact, it's part three of our Is, Was, Is to Come Christmas series we began back on December 16th. And so because of that, I just want to offer a public service announcement. Christmas isn't over. Uh, That's right, you can clap for that. Uh, Christmas Day may have come and gone, uh, but Christmas isn't over. And I'd like to uh, point to the words of the wise Ebenezer Scrooge as penned by Charles Dickens in his novella, A Christmas Carol. Scrooge says this to the ghost of Christmas yet to come. I will honor Christmas in my heart and try to keep it all the year. I will live in the past, the present, and the future. The spirits of all three shall strive within me. I will not shut out the lessons that they teach. And for the Christ follower, we honor Christmas in our heart and try to keep it all the year. And the beautiful reality for the believer is the recognition that Jesus is the greatest gift that's ever been given. And when the tree comes down and the lights go back in the box, our Savior the light of the world is still present and wants to walk with us every day. Praise God for that. And so let me be perhaps the last person to tell you, Merry Christmas. In this series, we're looking at three realities about King Jesus, that Jesus is, Jesus was, and Jesus is to come. And I'm going to take a hard right at this point and ask you a question. I promise it's going to make sense and tie in later. But here's the question. Have you ever lost one of your kids? We're not all parents in the room or joining online, so I'll phrase that differently. Uh, Have any of your parents ever lost you? Uh, I don't want to throw anybody under the bus, but my parents have. Uh, It was the summer of 1987. I was four years old and living with my family in sunny Southern California. My favorite TV show at the time was ALF. My favorite athlete was Oral Hershiser of the Los Angeles Dodgers. And I was still taking daily naps. I mean, you talk about eras, that was my era. Take me back, especially to the daily naps. But on this particular day, my family had joined with some friends to make a trip to Universal Studios theme park in Hollywood, California. And I'm sure we had a great day together. I was four, so I don't remember all of it, but I do remember a pretty significant part of that day. As we were making our way out of the park, one of the final things that we uh, saw, an attraction, really more more of a photo opportunity of sorts, uh, was this medieval stocks and pillory. That's this device where you put your hands and your head in and it closes down on you. And I don't know what movie that was affiliated with, but there were people there doing that and family members were taking pictures and having a good time. And I was just taking it all in. And at some point, I turned around and my parents were gone. And the group that I was walking with was still walking when I had stopped. And so I don't know what happened next. I don't know if I approached someone or someone approached me, but eventually I got connected with a security guard who took me to a small security building. I remember in the room that they had me, there was a TV with some cartoons playing. They gave me some ice cream, which was great, I'm sure. And, uh, and I don't remember all of the details, but I, I can pretty vividly remember just simply thinking, I wonder if my parents are going to come back for me. And if so, how long am I going to be here? How long is this going to take? And I just share that story with you because I think that there is a spiritual parallel there for us. That perhaps you have found yourself, or maybe you even find yourself right now, observing your own personal experience and the challenges that, that you're undoubtedly facing on some level. Or maybe you look around culturally or even globally and you see the chaos and confusion around the world. And perhaps you found yourself wondering where God is in all of it. And if he's going to show up and actually do something about it in our own lives and in the world around us. And if that's you, like it is often me, then this series is for you. 
And let me just tell you that he is, he was, and he is to come. And I want to begin our time together with a text that we have referenced in a series from the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. I'm going to read this for us, and then I'd like to pray and ask God just to speak through his word in whatever way he wants to. Here's what we read in Revelation, chapter 1, beginning in verse 4. This letter is from John to the seven churches in the province of Asia. Grace and peace to you from the one who is, who always was, and who is still to come. From the sevenfold spirit before his throne and from Jesus Christ. He is the faithful witness to these things. The first to rise from the dead and the ruler of all the kings of the world. All glory to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by shedding his blood for us. He has made us a kingdom of priests for God his Father. All glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. Look, he comes with the clouds of heaven. And everyone will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the nations of the world will mourn for him. Yes, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end, says the Lord God. I am the one who is, who always was, and who is still to come, the Almighty One. Father, we come before you, acknowledging just that, that you are the Almighty One. That you are, that you were, that you were yet to come. Thank you for the gift of your word that instructs us and convicts us and shapes us as we submit to the authority of your truth. Father, thank you for the grace and the kindness and the mercy that you offer. And I ask, Father, that as we consider your truth today, that for each person gathered here in this room and online, that you would meet them right where they're at. Speak to their hearts and minds in the ways that only you can and in all the ways that you want to. We thank you in advance for what you're going to do. We praise you and we pray all of this in the beautiful and powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Jesus is, Jesus was, and Jesus is to come. And today specifically, we're going to consider what it means that he is to come. And here's why it matters. This is a pretty basic truth I think we could all uh, agree on, that our belief about tomorrow shapes the way that we live today. What we believe to be true about tomorrow shapes the way that we live today. I'm going to ask you a series of rhetorical questions here, but would today be different for you if tomorrow was going to be your first day at a new school or a new job? My guess is the answer is yes. If you're starting at a new school or a new job tomorrow, as all of us have at one point or another, you know the jitters of the the day before and getting prepared and making sure that you're ready to go the next day. Uh, That would shape and change the way today would look and feel for you. Would today be different if someone famous or someone that you deeply respect was coming over to your house for breakfast tomorrow morning? My guess is today would look a little bit different. You might spend a bunch of time cleaning. You might be preparing in some way. You might be building some nervous anxiety about them showing. But I can promise you that if Oral Hershiser or Alf were coming to my house tomorrow for breakfast, today would look a whole lot different than it does. And I don't mean to get too uh, overly dark, but would today be different if you knew that you were going to pass away tomorrow? Of course, today would look different if you believed any one of those things to be true about tomorrow. Our belief about tomorrow shapes the way that we live today. We understand that. And to connect it to what we're considering today, here's what's also true, that our belief about the one who is to come shapes who we become. What we believe about the one who is to come shapes who we become. Now, I wouldn't uh, 
certainly wouldn't consider myself famous or even someone necessarily that you deeply respect, but if I were to be that individual to come to your house tomorrow for breakfast and we enjoyed a meal together and then we finished up over a cup of coffee and good conversation, and I were to ask you the question, what are you looking forward to? What might be some of the things that you would share with me in that conversation? What are some of the things that you're looking forward to? Uh, You might say, or you might be thinking even now, that you're looking forward to getting together with some friends and family to watch the ball drop, if you can stay up that late. That's going to be a challenge for me. Uh, In the short term, maybe you're looking forward to whatever New Year's Eve party you have uh, lined up. One thing I know for sure would be on your list, I'm sure it's on all of our lists when we think about the things that we're looking forward to, uh, is the 2024 presidential election. We're really looking forward to that, right? Yeah, I heard, yeah, I hear the groans. It's going to be a dumpster fire. Just get ready, okay? (laughs) I've shared this at other opportunities I've had to to preach. Uh, I'm looking forward to someday, one day, hopefully in my lifetime, the Cincinnati Bengals winning the Super Bowl. I'm becoming less and less convinced that that's actually going to happen, but it's still on my list. (laughs) Fingers crossed. Uh, Just in the last couple of weeks, I found myself looking forward to something that I haven't really looked forward to before. As I see friends with new babies, I'm always reminded that I don't have a baby anymore. Our youngest, Judah, aka Jude the Dude, is five years old. He's not a baby anymore. And I found myself in the last couple of weeks looking forward to hopefully one day, someday, becoming a grandpa. I hear being a grandparent's a pretty good gig. Is that right? I got that right? Yeah. Um, I'm looking forward to that. So I don't know what would be on your list, and and I don't intend for this to be some Jesus juke moment, but I wonder in the conversation that we would have over that cup of coffee, if one of your answers to what you're looking forward to would be the return of Jesus. And I wonder how long the list would have to get or how long the conversation would have to be before Jesus returning would show up on your list of things that you're looking forward to. And I think it's important that we recognize the the value of this because the Christian faith is a forward-looking faith. Uh, Many people wrongly believe that our faith is about a bunch of things that happened a bunch of years ago. And while that's entirely true that our faith is rooted in in history and what actually happened, namely Jesus' birth and death, burial, and resurrection, but that's not the full story. And the definition that we have of faith that we find in Scripture in the book of Hebrews chapter 11 says this, that faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. In other words, our faith isn't just about what we believe happened, but what we believe will happen, what is to come. And we're generally comfortable with thinking about the future outside of our faith. In fact, many of us uh, will make some sort of New Year's resolution in spite of the fact that we know that very few of us will actually carry them out. Uh, You've probably seen the research, depending on which one you reference, it's about less than 10% of those who make a New Year's resolution actually keep it. And yet what I have found in nearly two decades of ministry and in observing my own life and tendencies is that when we think about the future, we often overestimate what we believe we can and will accomplish in the future And we often underestimate what we believe God can and will accomplish and do for us. And I think part of uh, what is at play here is an emotional response to the way that we think about the future. And for a moment, I want you to, to not think with your brain, but with your heart. And if I were to to offer you a a, a continuum with great hope on one end and great fear on the other. And I would ask you to place an X marking how you feel when you think about the future. Where would you mark yourself? Not the right answer, what you know you should uh, think or know you should feel, but how, when you think about your future, how do you actually feel? In my experience, I think for many, if not most of us, it's a mixed bag and that X would probably be somewhere near the middle. 
Lord, we've got some hope, but we've also got some anxiety. We've got some excitement, but we also have some fear. For some of you, you know, we're living in an age of anxiety. We're seeing that all over the place. For some of you, that mark, that X might be far closer to the great fear side of the spectrum. And if that's the case, I want to just remind you of the words of Jesus that we find in Matthew chapter 6. Don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. And Jesus taught this in the context, in a broader context of the truth, that we serve and worship a faithful father who knows our needs and promises to provide for them. And so when we think about the future, we really don't need to fear. We should never worry, but we must wonder. And some have taken this concept too far to think that, that what, what it means and what God wants us to do is just focus on the here and the now and the present and not really think too much about the future at all. We hear these phrases like carpe diem, seize the day, or eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die, and it's all about the here and now. Even in religious circles, I've heard the phrase that someone is so heavenly minded that they're of no earthly good. And yet I don't think our problem is that we think too much of the future. I think it's that we think too little of it. That we've lost our wonder for what God wants for us and for what he will do, what he's promised is coming. And in fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, we read that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. And scripture is bursting with the wonder of the one who is to come. When we look at the Old Testament, we see 230 verses that reference Jesus' first coming, his birth and his death, his burial and his resurrection. But we see over 1,500 Old Testament passages that reference his second coming, and in the New Testament, on average, one out of 25 verses mentions Jesus' return. Scripture is bursting with the wonder of the one who is to come. And so because of that, I want to share with you in practicality what is to come when Jesus returns and why it matters for us. I want to share two things that the one who is to come will bring and two reasons why it matters so much. First, when it comes to what is to come, the one who is to come will bring judgment. Now, when I first say that, you might think, that doesn't sound like great news, Aaron. Uh, judgment is not something many of us get warm fuzzies about. We certainly live in a culture where just about the worst thing you could possibly do is judge someone else. And yet this is really good news, and I'll tell you why in a moment. But here's what we read in John chapter 5, Jesus' words about this. I tell you the truth, the Son can do nothing by himself. He does only what he sees the Father doing. Whatever the Father does, the Son also does. For the Father loves the Son and shows him everything he's doing. In fact, the Father will show him how to do even greater works than healing this man. Then you will truly be astonished. For just as the Father gives life to those he raises from the dead, so the Son gives life to anyone he wants. In addition, the Father judges no one. Instead, he has given the Son absolute authority to judge, so that everyone will honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Anyone who does not honor the Son is certainly not honoring the Father who sent him. And I tell you the truth, those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me have eternal life. They will never be condemned for their sins, but they have already passed from death to life. And I assure you that the time is coming. Indeed, it's here now when the dead will hear my voice, the voice of the Son of God, and those who listen will live. The Father has life in himself, and he has granted that same life-giving power to his Son. And he has given him authority to judge everyone because he is the Son of Man. Don't be so surprised. Indeed, the time is coming 
When all the dead in their graves will hear the voice of God's Son and they will rise again, those who have done good will rise to experience eternal life and those who have continued in evil will rise to experience judgment. I can do nothing on my own. I judge as God tells me. Therefore, my judgment is just because I carry out the will of the one who sent me, not my own will. The good news of the gospel is that Jesus says that those who listen to his message and believe are freed from condemnation and have the assurance of eternal life. Because of who Jesus is and what he's done, God has forgiven you as you have believed in Jesus for your sin and there is no condemnation for you in Christ Jesus. There's no better news than that. And yet what's equally true is that those who do not believe will be judged accordingly. And this is good news because it means that something is going to be done about the suffering and injustice that we see and experience around us. I don't know, maybe you're like me in the sense that you found yourself at times looking around Maybe even, again, in your own experience or maybe more broadly in our culture or in what's happening around the world. And you see on full display the evil and the injustice that happens in our world. Some of it makes me literally sick to my stomach as I read and I watch reports of the evil being done in our world. And in those very same moments, I often feel helpless, like, what, what could I possibly do to make a difference? Someone has to pay for that. There should be judgment and justice for that evil. And what I know to be true is that the one who is to come is going to do something about it. His judgment, his justice is a gift to us because something will be done about the evil and suffering in our world. Secondly, the one who is to come will bring salvation. In Hebrews chapter nine, here's what we read. For Christ did not enter into a holy place made with human hands, which was only a copy of the one true in heaven. He entered into heaven itself to appear now before God on our behalf. And he did not enter heaven to offer himself again and again, like the high priest here on earth who enters the most holy place year after year with the blood of an animal. If that had been necessary, Christ would have to die again and again ever since the world began. But now, once for all time, he has appeared at the end of the age to remove sin by his own death as a sacrifice. And just as each person is destined to die once, and after that comes judgment, so also Christ was offered once for all time as a sacrifice to take away the sins of many people. He will come again, not to deal with our sins, but to bring salvation to all who are eagerly waiting for him. Are you eagerly waiting for his return? Because what we believe about tomorrow shapes how we live today. What we believe about the one who is to come shapes who we become. Well, why does that matter? Well, first of all, the one who is to come brings strength for today. I don't know what you're facing right now, I know what I'm facing and I need strength for it. Anybody else need a little extra strength for what you've got going on right now? It was Jesus' belief about what was to come that gave him the strength to be faithful in the present. And here's what we read in Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, 
the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. And now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. You see, it was Jesus' understanding about the future that allowed him to be faithful to the Father in the present, even in the face of the brutality of the cross. That's why it's so critical that you and I understand what our future holds, what is to come, because it gives us the strength that we need for today. In full view of the cross, not diminishing its depravity in any way, Jesus fixed his eyes on the Father and remained faithful. And in full view of our troubles, and they are many and they are significant, we fix our eyes on Jesus, who is to come for the strength we need to be faithful. And secondly, the one who is to come brings hope for tomorrow. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14 says, The grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people. And we are instructed to turn from godless living and sinful pleasures. We should live in this evil world with wisdom, righteousness, and devotion to God. While we look forward with hope to that wonderful day when the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be revealed. He gave his life to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us, and to make us his very own people, totally committed to doing good deeds. That wonderful day is coming. Jesus is the one who is to come and his glory will be on full display. He will be revealed as the one who gave his life for us so that we might be made his very own. I began my message by throwing my parents under the bus, so I need to make amends for that here by admitting that... um, at least on one occasion, I did misplace one of my kids. A couple of years ago, my wife Sarah and I were celebrating our wedding anniversary, and we had plans for just the two of us to go out later that night together. But during the day, we wanted to spend some time together as a family. And so we loaded our kids up, and we headed to the local zoo. It was the Fort Wayne Children's Zoo. And the kids were a little bit younger at the time, and so we had to take two strollers, and many, several of them were in diapers, probably all of them, I don't remember. Uh, but we, we made it to the zoo, and that in and of itself was an accomplishment. And once we made it through the gates, we visited the first attraction. I wonder if you can guess what it was, the restrooms. It's always the first attraction for our family with little kids. And we got that figured out, and we headed to the second attraction, which was the outdoor gift shop. So we're really two for two at this point. We haven't seen a single animal other than the ones we brought with us. And, uh, and at this outdoor gift shop, it was just a beautiful sunny day and they had these bubble machines going and so bubbles were flying through the air and the kids were having a good time and, and it was exactly what we wanted to experience that day as a family, just celebrating our marriage. And, and we were enjoying it so much that we got a bit distracted and eventually we recognized that one of our kiddos wasn't with us. And, and the kid that had uh, been lost or left behind at some point uh, was our daughter, Leah. I've shared about her before, but Leah is on the autism spectrum and she is nonverbal. And so you can imagine in this moment, just the panic that washed across us as we realized that our daughter was lost and she wouldn't be able to tell anybody who she was or who we were. And we went uh, to uh, fear and panic mode real quickly. And we began to, to walk around and ask the workers there if they had seen a little girl by herself. And then we began to yell out Leah's name and panic was really setting in and, and, 
We couldn't think about anything else in that moment other than finding our lost child. I want to tell you there there are two things that never crossed our minds in that moment. The first is, is we did not think, well, you know what, Leah left and she got lost on her own. It's really not our fault. She didn't stay with us, so we shouldn't feel bad about this. That didn't cross our minds. What also did not cross our minds was, well, you know what, we got a lot of kids and we only lost one, so we're doing pretty good, you know. (laughs) No, we, we would not stop looking until we found Leah. And when we did, our hearts were filled with such joy and relief that I couldn't possibly articulate those feelings to you today. But I share that story with you to say, we have a heavenly father who loves us so greatly that he's done everything within his power to make a way for us to be found and restored to a right relationship with him. And I don't know what life has done to you. I don't know how you have found yourself lost at times, maybe even lost in some way right now, but you have to know that you have a heavenly father who has not stopped pursuing you since the very day he made you. You are so deeply loved. He is, he was, he is to come for you. I want to finish by encouraging with the words of 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 2 through 15. I want you to remember what the holy prophets said long ago and what our Lord and Savior commanded through your apostles. Most importantly, I want to remind you that in the last days, scoffers will come mocking the truth and following their own desires. And they will say, what happened to the promise that Jesus is coming again? From before the times of our ancestors, everything has remained the same since the world was first created. They deliberately forget that God made the heavens long ago by the word of his command, and he brought the earth out from the water and surrounded it with water. And then he used the water to destroy the ancient world with a mighty flood. And by the same word, the present heavens and earth have been stored up for fire. They're being kept for the day of judgment when ungodly people will be destroyed. But you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord. A thousand years is like a day. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he's being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but he wants everyone to repent. But the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. And the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise, and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire, and the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment." And since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives you should live. Looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. On that day, he will set the heavens on fire and the elements will melt away in the flames. But we are looking forward to the new heavens and new earth. He has promised a world filled with God's righteousness. And so, dear friends, while you are waiting for these things to happen, make every effort to be found living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless in his sight. And remember, our Lord's patience gives people time to be saved. Our belief about what's to come Our belief about the one who is to come shapes who we become. Will you trust him? Will you live today like he's going to bring judgment and salvation? 
And will you look to him alone for your strength for today and your hope for tomorrow? I pray you will. I pray you will.